First, let me tell you about my car. I recently took my car to an auto mechanic. I told him my fan belt was squeaking, uh, the first gear in my transmission was slipping, the check engine warning light was flashing on my dashboard, and there was a terrible knock in my engine. He said, uh, leave it in his shop, and he would look it over. When I called back and asked what was wrong with my car, he said it would cost me $800 to get it fixed. I gasped and said, well, what's wrong with it? He said, I don't know. You don't know? Well, how can you fix it if you don't know what's wrong with it? What did you do for the squeaking fan belt, I asked. I removed it, he said. But I can't drive the car without a fan belt. Oh, it'll work for a while, he said. Well, how about my first gear? I removed it, he said. You removed my first gear? It's okay, he said. You have second and third gears. It'll work for a while. Well, what about the check engine warning light on my dashboard? Oh, I cut the wires to that light. It won't bother you anymore. And how about the knock in my engine? Then he handed me some earplugs. I looked him straight in the eye and I said, you're not a mechanic. You're a doctor. You see, that's what we doctors do. We cover up the symptoms with drugs or remove the part. Now, you would never let an auto mechanic attempt to repair your car if he didn't first find out exactly what was wrong with it, would you? You expect better from your mechanic than to just remove the parts from your car that aren't working rather than fixing them, or to cover up the symptoms such as the knock in your engine by handing you a pair of earplugs. But think about it. That's exactly what we doctors are trained to do. If an organ in your body is not working and is causing you trouble, symptoms, we doctors do one of two things. We give you drugs to cover up the symptoms, or if that doesn't work, we just take out the organ or part by surgery. We never fix the problem. Why? Because doctors don't understand the underlying causes for nearly all disease. We're never taught what causes cancer, because even the so-called experts admit they don't know what causes cancer. Medical textbooks admit that for 80 to 90 percent of all diseases, the cause is unknown. So if doctors don't know the cause for your disease, why would you let them give you treatments such as drugs or surgery that can kill you or damage your body severely when they don't understand what's causing your problem? If your mechanic does a bad job on your repairs, you can at least buy a new car. But you'll let a doctor who admits he or she doesn't know the cause of your problem work on your body, your life, and that's the only body you've got. In order to really fix anything, you must have a clear understanding of what's causing the problem. Now, let's talk about cancer. The only treatment an orthodox medical do doctor is taught to give you for cancer is chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. But cancer is not caused by a deficiency of chemotherapy, nor is it caused by a deficiency of radiation. Just as headaches are not caused by a deficiency of aspirin, and stomach upsets are not caused by a deficiency of antacids, and joint pains are not caused by a deficiency of anti-inflammatory drugs. All of those treatments just cover up the symptoms while the underlying problem, the disease, is still there. Now, it's important to understand that chemotherapy is a poisonous drug. Chemotherapy and radiation both destroy your immune system. That's the only system in your body that can get you well. In fact, both chemotherapy and radiation actually cause cancer. There are many articles in the medical literature documenting this, and every doctor knows that very well. The point is that the treatment we doctors give often kills you. But you can reverse cancer and actually get well by addressing the underlying cause of the cancer. So how about cutting out the cancer? Even if you have the cancer cut out or the organ removed by surgery, you still have left in your body all of the factors that allowed your cancer to develop in the first place. Unless you change all of those factors, the cancer will return either in the same organ or in another organ, or you will develop another type of disease. And if you cut out the mass or tumor, 
What are you going to use to follow your progress on rebuilding your immune system and eliminating your cancer? Now, I'm not telling you that you shouldn't have it removed. That decision is up to you. I'm just suggesting that you evaluate all the options before you proceed. Now, how about removing the lymph nodes? The lymph nodes are part of your immune system. If they have cancer in them, that means they're doing their job. They are the little guards at the gate whose job it is to keep the cancer from spreading. When they're removed, then the barriers to the spread of cancer are decreased and the cancer can spread more rapidly. So what does cause cancer? Is cancer inherited? Does cancer run in families? Even if your great-grandmother, your grandmother, and your mother had breast cancer or some other kind of cancer, that doesn't mean it's genetic. Oh, it's passed down in families all right, but not necessarily in the genes. Your great-grandmother teaches your grandmother how to eat, live, and handle stress. And your grandmother teaches your mother, and your mother teaches you. Now, a very tiny percentage of cancer is genetic, but it's hardly worth mentioning. Parents teach their children how to eat and how to handle stress, either directly or by example. They teach them good ways to eat and handle stress, or they teach them bad ways to eat and bad ways to handle stress. This is the way that disease, including cancer, is handed down from generation to generation, not in the genes, except in very, very rare cases but in the ways we're taught to eat and handle or not handle life stresses. Well, how about viruses causing cancer? That's a popular theory now among medical experts. Sounds logical, doesn't it? Since everyone agrees that germs cause disease, but do they? When a doctor looks under the microscope and sees germs, such as bacteria or viruses, in contact with dead or diseased tissues, our response is, voila, this germ this bacteria or virus is actually causing the disease. So we conclude that in order to get rid of the disease, we must destroy the germs with antibiotics or other drugs, all with harmful side effects. So we doctors prescribe the drugs, and guess what? The symptoms of the disease stop like magic because the antibiotics do indeed, in many instances, kill off the bacteria, and the patient feels better at least for a time. But just because germs, viruses, and bacteria are in contact with dead and dying cells and tissue, and just because the patient feels better when the germs are killed off, doesn't necessarily mean that the germs are actually causing the disease. Let me ask you, if bacteria and viruses and flies and other insects are on a pile of dead and decaying garbage, did the bacteria and the viruses and the flies cause the pile of garbage? No, the scraps of vegetables started decaying because they were separated from their life force, the tree or the ground, when they were picked. The garbage, the decaying matter, attracted the flies and the bacteria and the viruses as the cleanup crew. If you kill off the bacteria and viruses and flies and other insects and animal scavengers whose job in nature is to clean up the garbage, will the garbage go away by itself? Of course not. Over time, the flies and other insects, together with the bacteria and viruses and maybe other animal scavengers, will completely eat up that pile of garbage. Destroying the cleanup crew will only allow the pile of decaying garbage to exist much longer. God has created an ingenious system of keeping the world clean. If there's a dead animal in the road, here come the insects and the scavenger animals and maybe even vultures the scavengers of the air, to eat up the decaying flesh of the animal. Nature's cleanup crew is always available and ready to go. In the ocean, crabs and lobsters and other ocean scavengers eat up the dead fish and the decaying sea creatures. The dead creatures attract the cleanup crew. Land scavengers eat up dead animals to keep the environment clean. And those scavengers don't eat live, healthy animals, only dead, rotting flesh. In every instance, the dead flesh attracts the scavenger cleanup crew, the vultures or insects and viruses and bacteria. These viruses and bacteria never cause the dead flesh. 
It's the same on the tissue level. For hundreds of years in medicine, maggots were used to clean up infected wounds. The maggots don't cause the problem, they just clean up the dead and decaying tissue in the wound, leaving it perfectly clean and ready for healing. And they never touch healthy tissue. They can tell the precise difference between healthy and unhealthy tissue. They only eat up the dead part. That's what all scavengers do. So, if germs don't cause garbage, they're only there to clean up the mess, then what are they doing in our body? The idea that germs actually cause disease, which is known as the germ theory, was promoted by a French physician, Louis Pasteur, the pasteurization of milk Pasteur, way back in the 1800s, and was embraced and totally accepted by all of orthodox medicine since that time, even till today. Pasteur said the germ is everything and the milieu or the immune system of the body is nothing. Meaning the condition of your immune system doesn't matter. It only matters, he said, if you come in contact with the germ and then you're absolutely destined to get the disease. But Pasteur's contemporary named Antoine Beauchamp, a physician and expert in his own right, he was professor of biochemistry and dean of the faculty of medicine at a very prestigious university medical school in France. He strongly disagreed. Beauchamp said, germs don't cause disease. Disease is a result of the deterioration of the body's defense mechanisms, the immune system, and the germs come in to clean up the dead tissue and the dead cells. Beauchamp said that the milieu, the immune system, is everything and the germ is nothing. If your immune system is working properly, the germs will not cause disease. But Pasteur worked for the government, so then, as now, he received more media coverage and unwavering support even in his error, and the medical establishment has been embracing his theory ever since. But if the theory is wrong, it will never lead to success in finding cures for diseases. That's the main reason the war on cancer has been a miserable failure. Beauchamp had developed in his own laboratory a very powerful microscope. He could see in the blood of healthy people tiny forms much smaller than cells and even smaller than bacteria that he named microzymas. He discovered these tiny bodies are pleomorphic. That means that they can change from one shape or form into another shape or form. These same tiny bodies that can change form depending on the condition of the person's immune system were also documented by an extraordinary scientist inventor named Royal Rife, who about 60 years ago built possibly the world's greatest microscope a light microscope with magnification and resolution so superior that it was possible to study live bacteria and viruses, something even present-day scientists cannot do. He observed and photographed bacteria that were pleomorphic, just as Beauchamp had discovered. They could change their form. A bacteria could actually become a virus or a fungus. The ability of these tiny bodies to turn into bacteria and viruses and fungi was again confirmed by Dr. Virginia Livingston, a physician, a professor at Rutgers University, and an outstanding cancer researcher who for years directed her own cancer clinic in San Diego. This tiny body, the microzyma, as named by Beauchamp, was renamed and more clear, clearly defined by Dr. Gaston Naissons, a brilliant chemist and physicist now living and working in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, who studied at the same university in France where over a hundred years before Antoine Beauchamp had taught. Naissons built a super specialized microscope for studying these tiny living organisms which he named somatids. Over years of careful microscopic observation and laboratory experimentation, Naissons went on to discover that if and when the immune system of an animal or a human being becomes weakened or destabilized, 
the normal three-stage cycle of the somatid goes through 13 additional successive growth stages to make up a total of 16 separate forms, each form evolving into the next. All of these forms have been revealed clearly and in detail by motion pictures and by still photography under Naissance microscope. If a person is healthy with a properly functioning immune system, he will have floating free in his blood numerous somatids in their most basic natural form. However, when the immune system becomes suppressed from improper nutrition, lack of sleep, stress, radiation, chemotherapy, or other powerful drugs, or any other assault to the body, the somatids begin a cycle of change into one of 13 different additional forms. The somatids actually become bacteria in rod forms or spore forms, or they may progress into yeast or mycelial forms, a type of fungus. These somatids change into the type of organism that the body needs to clean up the dead or dying cells produced by the stress or other assault on the body. But when they clean up the dead and dying cells, the detoxification process produces symptoms. This is what we doctors call disease. So you see, we can actually produce bacteria, viruses, or yeast in our own body just by not taking care of our immune system properly. Our body has this built-in fantastic mechanism to produce just the right organism to clean up the mess we have caused in our own cells, tissues, and organs. Just think about it. If you have Epstein-Barr virus or candida, hepatitis, herpes, or other organisms, the way to get rid of them is not to take powerful antibiotics or other drugs to destroy them, but to rebuild your immune system by totally natural methods so you will have no dead or dying tissue in your body for these organisms to feed on. And by the way, it's impossible to rebuild the immune system using drug medications. All drugs have side effects. The immune system can only be rebuilt by totally natural methods. So you can see all these organisms, the bacteria and the viruses and the yeast and the fungi can arise within our body. Disease doesn't have to come from without. So it's clear that a person does not have to catch a disease. We can produce it within ourselves. In the mid-1800s, the famous nurse Florence Nightingale witnessed and wrote about diseases appearing in people in isolated places where no one could possibly have caught the disease from someone else. She also documented that one disease with worsening of the patient's immune system could turn into another disease. She concluded that there are not specific isolated diseases, only disease conditions. By the way, she was one of the researchers who had completely refuted the germ theory, the notion that germs cause disease, years before Pasteur had even proposed it. So, if germs don't cause disease, then viruses can't be the cause of cancer. The viruses are there as the cleanup crew. If we kill off all these organisms that are there trying to clean up the mess in our body, we may feel better for a time. But the mass of dead and dying cells and tissue is still there and will progressively, over time, continue to get worse. Thus, we set the stage for a more deadly disease. So the cause of cancer is not viruses, and we've already seen that the cause is rarely genetic. So what about the ozone hole and the environmental pollution? Well, they may play a tiny role in the cause of cancer, but just think. I and many others that I know have gotten well from cancer by natural methods even though the ozone hole and the environmental pollution haven't changed. In fact, they may have gotten worse. This shows they have very little to do with the problem. So what does cause cancer? The answer has been known for well over a hundred years. Ellen White, a brilliant, godly woman, a health reformer, and the most prolific woman author in America, 
penned the answer in the 1800s in a book called Ministry of Healing. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. Let me repeat that. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from the conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In other words, all disease is a direct result of violating the natural laws of health. So what are the laws of health? They are proper healthful nutrition, natural nutrition, regular exercise, drinking 10 glasses of water every day, daily sunlight, abstinence from harmful substances including alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, sugar, and all the chemicals that are in food including preservatives and aspartame, NutraSweet, and MSG. Plus lots of fresh air every day, proper rest at the proper time of night, relief of stress by learning to trust God, an attitude of gratitude, that's thankfulness, and benevolence, doing things for others instead of always thinking of oneself. Sounds too simple, doesn't it? But all disease, including cancer, is caused by a violation of these 10 seemingly simple laws. The way I got well from severe advanced cancer, the way I reversed my cancer was to institute these 10 natural health laws in my life with total 100% commitment.